Another important topic that will affect the scalability of your API platform is, of course, security. And uh, as I said before, but in case you weren't here, my name is Travis Spencer. I'm the CEO of Curity. And in this talk, I want to give you a comprehensive overview of API security, looking at all of the different API security standards and how they fit together to hopefully turn it in from a sort of jumbled up soup or mess into something practical and applicable that you can use and wrap your, your mind around and begin applying uh, in your API platform. So what I'd like to do is to, first of all, point out that there are over 50 specifications related to API security that you need to be aware of, depending on how you count. But the way I counted, it was about 50. And if you print those out, that's over 2,000 printed pages. And just by way of comparison, that is over uh, almost twice as many as War and Peace. And that is almost seven times as many printed pages as in uh, Homer's The Odyssey. So that's a lot of information, first of all, to read. I've never read War and Peace. But it's even more to comprehend and understand and be able to apply. So let's, let's look at all of those different security standards. We can't go into a lot of depth in this detail. But each, at least having an awareness of what they are, what parts and chapters you can skip, so to say, I think will, will help you to get going on your scalability of your API security platform. The relevant standards are coming from two primary standards bodies. That is the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, or the IETF, and the OpenID Foundation. The IETF is the organization who gives us HTTP, TCP, UDP, uh, SMTP, uh, SMTP, protocols that we're all using right now, uh, and we use every day and we take for granted. This really are standardizing the backbone of the internet and are creating standards that have impl been implemented by thousands of vendors in interoperable ways. So it's really should give us a lot of peace of mind that the standards and the protocols uh, that we are using in API security are coming from such an open and excellent organization as the IETF. Another is the OpenID Foundation, and this is an organization devoted to creating and protecting the OpenID protocol. It's an international organization that's nonprofit. It's existed for a decade, uh, and it's been, uh, it certifies the compliance of vendor implementations in an open way. And this, too, should give us confidence in the protocols that we're using that they're backed by such great organizations. Another that I'll point out is also the Kantara Initiative. And this organization is an incubator for other standards that have been fed into the other organizations. And they also have standards of their own that they're governing. There are a lot of different overarching specifications that we need to be aware of as we look at API security. And the most important one is HTTP. HTTP is something that we're, we're all tangentially familiar with at this conference, I would say. Uh, but for API security, it's something that you need to have a, a very deep awareness of uh, if you are, especially if you're implementing uh, any sort of OAuth server or OpenID Connect server. As we built the Curity Identity Server, I was shocked at how deep of an expertise we needed to gain in HTTP. You can't just leave it to the app server to take care of it all. Uh, HTTP is defining the messages, the headers, the status codes, and you have an obligation uh, as you implement your API security to conform to that standards and to, uh, to meet the, the, those requirements. And those could be very intricate details, like uh, did you know that HTTP headers can come not only at the beginning of a message, but can come at the end of a message? Um, other th details about clients that are very polite, asking you if they can continue with an upload, uh, asking you to tell them, first of all, if that's allowed. So a lot of details in HTTP that no matter if you're working with security or just APIs, uh, this is a good skill to have, good to learn more about um, and to, to dig into. So you'll want to check out those uh, standards and also the newer version of that, which is HTTP2 or, or H2, uh, which is similar to uh, the uh, uh, existing protocol, except that the stream is binary. And this will actually allow us to begin taking advantage of binary tokens, which I'll talk about more 
uh, toward the end of my talk. There's also a need to communicate with the security token service uh, in an encrypted channel, and for that we have TCP-based uh, encryption using TLS, and if we're using UDP, uh, we can use Datagram <coughs> Transport Layer Security, or DTLS. And those give us that secure communication between the different parties that are involved. We also have something called Jose, and uh, this is defining a uh, JSON-based um, encryption and algorithm and token format that we can use. And this is a, a handful of different RFCs that define uh, how all of that works, and I'll get into that in a bit. We also have UMA for user-to-user -user delegation, and really the heart of the API security is OAuth2. And this is defining a number of flows, uh, message exchange patterns that can be used between the actors in the security system. Uh, it's also providing a way to do uh, delegation so that you can authorize a third party to consume data on your behalf. And on top of that is sort of a, a framework or meta protocol. We have other specifications, including UMA, but also uh, OpenID Connect, which is providing an identity layer on top of OAuth, because OAuth does not provide a way for the application to find out anything about the user. OpenID Connect adds that into there. So if you're implementing these, you have a, a handful of, of specs to read uh, in the OpenID Connect as well, and I'll summarize those for you in a bit. And you also have system for cross-domain identity management. This is a couple of, of RFCs that are coming from the IETF that define an API for doing create, read, update, and delete, or CRUD, of users and groups. And it's also giving you a standard schema that's uh, encoded in JSON that you can use to um, create those groups of users. So these are your overarching specifications. As I said, OAuth is the heart of all of these. This is sort of a framework or a meta protocol uh, that's used and profiled by other uh, standards. OAuth uh, is RFC 67, 49, and 50, and it obsoletes OAuth 10A. Uh, OAuth 10A is uh, um, not something that you should be using in greenfield development and something that should be phased out if you are using it. Uh, two reasons for that. Primarily the, uh, uh, the issue of IPR, which is taken care of by the, or intellectual property rights, which is taken care of by the IETF creating an RFC around this that protects you. Uh, but more importantly is that the OAuth 10A put all of the security, well not all of the, much of the security burden on the client. So the actual applications that were creating and interacting with the OAuth server had a lot to do to sign messages and to uh, actually secure those messages. And as a consequence, it made it a lot harder to write applications that were communicating with OAuth servers. So in OAuth 2, the burden and complexity was pushed onto the server and not onto the client. So now you can make clients very, very quickly, uh, but you can un it's very complicated to make a server. And this is actually good for the scalability of security because we're going to have, what, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of servers, but we're going to have millions, or if, if this stuff really takes off, billions and billions of APIs so, uh, and clients. So this is really helping in the scalability, and where you should start is with OAuth 2. Um, OAuth 2 also defines a way of exchanging tokens and sending tokens around, building on top of the HTTP protocol uh, for authentication, and it defines a way of uh, distributing bearer tokens in HTTP messages. Uh, HTTP, or bearer tokens themselves, uh, come with some security implications, and I'll talk about how we can balance that toward the end of my talk. In the internet, we hear a lot about JOTS and how JOTS are going to make the API secure, but JOTS in themselves, we need to unpack that and see that that's actually a handful of specifications uh, the JOT itself, is, is, which stands for JSON Web Token, is a way of encoding a token in a JSON format, and then we can actually sign that, that um, document. And when we do that and combine it with a signature, it's called a JWS, which maybe would be called a JUICE, but I've never heard anyone call it that. Uh, and we can also encrypt those JOTs, and that then would be a JWE. 
And uh, what's also very interesting and maybe lesser known is that there is also an RFC uh, or a standard for defining how we can uh, mark up keys in JSON so that we can mark up a public key and we can actually mark up um, private keys and algorithms uh, that are used and ciphers that are used with those keys. And that's done by JWK. And this actually provides a, a very lightweight key distribution system over TLS so that we can call into an OAuth server, get a set of information that we can use to create keys and verify these uh, JSON web uh, tokens. And every OpenID Connect server is required by the standard to uh, implement JWK. So we actually, in our microservices, get for free a lightweight key distribution system. And JWA is about the algorithms that can be used, because we can use uh, all sorts of different hashing algorithms, encryption algorithms, decryption algorithms, and those can be marked up using JWA. So OAuth, which I mentioned in a couple slides ago, and JOT are forming the backbone of OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect is the sort of third version of OpenID. So this is the, the successor uh, of OpenID 2, and really um, sort of a reboot of that. And this builds on top of OAuth and uses JSON web tokens and adds some additional information that's very, very important. Because in OAuth, the only one who gets a token is the API. And the poor mobile app or front-end application was sort of left out. And so what OpenID Connect does is it, it defines some additional token types so that that application can figure out how the user logged in, when they logged in. Um, it can ask that the user, if the user is already logged in. And uh, this allows the, the um, client application to make security decisions of its own, which is important for the scalability so that only the API, not only the API is secure, but also the applications. It also defines some additional flows. So it, uh, sometimes you will have a, a client that's sort of split apart, where you have the, the front end like a single page application and its associated back end. So using a standard flow called the hybrid flow, you can get different tokens into each of those parts of the application. And that's important because you'll have different security considerations. On that single page application, you might not want to uh, provided with personally identifiable information, whereas in the back end that's running on a server, you might feel safer doing that. So being able to split that apart and get different tokens with different information into there uh, is possible using the hybrid flow. And in both of the basic and implicit flow, uh, the client application is able to get that identity token that includes the information about the user, but also uh, having an access token to call a standard API for getting additional user information, which is called the user info endpoint. Another extremely uh, interesting and helpful uh, couple of add-ons that OpenID Connect give us is around discoverability and dynamic client registration. I'll get to those in, in a bit more detail, but this allows for creating very, very scalable systems, uh, even at the global level. So those are super exciting. And these are sort of the bread and butter of API security. So like, we should all know these. We should all have a basic comprehension of these as we're working in the API space. But this is only where we start. We have a lot more to do. So I want to dig in now and look at the meat of this. One of the, the very important extra protocols or standards that we need to know about is introspection. So we have these tokens. What's inside of them? Sometimes we know because the tokens themselves, like those JSON web tokens, have all the information, but sometimes the tokens don't have that information. In either case, we need to ask the token service, hey, Mr. Token Server, what, what does this token refer to? What's in here? And introspection is a standard API for doing that. And it is, depending on who you ask, when you ask, and the conditions, it might actually include different information. So there's nothing in in the standard that says introspection must always be returning the same result to every single application. So introspection can be highly dynamic. It can issue new tokens, it can issue handfuls of tokens, and in that way can turn into a sort of a token issuance protocol. Uh, another related draft standard around that same sort of concept is token exchange. Uh, the difference with token exchange and introspection is token ex exchange is like give one token and get a new token back of a different sort, uh, whereas introspection can be sort of a shotgun and you can issue all sorts of, of different token types through that. 
uh, or even no tokens, just as JSON. There's also a standard for doing revocation. So I've got this token that represents a user uh, delegating access to some application, and I want that delegation to be revoked. So that standard API says, okay, give me a token and I'll, I'll revoke that. Uh, and this can be quite helpful in cases where the user is in control and wants to actually uh, revoke that access. But it's not as helpful when some other user, like a customer support representative, wants to revoke access on behalf of that user. Uh, or an employee who's left the company and access needs to be revoked. So we can use other protocols like I'll get to in a, in a bit, uh, like Skim, to, to handle those use cases. In the OpenID Foundation, we also have standards for doing logout. There's two kinds of logout that you want to think about. One is, OK, I'm on my application, and the user clicks logout. I actually want to log out of the OpenID Connect server as well, so that uh, if the, another application integrates with that, they'll have to log in anew. And that uh, logout can be done on the front channel, in other words, through the browser. And it can also be done on the back channel. So like the application, the web application, can make a web service call to the OpenID Connect server and say, end his session. Uh, and in that, that can be quite helpful so that you know, if you have a lot of services to log out of, the user might just click the browser and then they're still logged in. So with the back channel approach, you can go over there and nuke that user's session uh, even if they, they don't close the, the browser or finish the session cleanly. So there's different types of, of logout and different cases where you'll use that. There's also a couple of protocols that you want to be aware of if you're building single page applications. One is session management, which also comes from the OpenID Foundation. And this allows you to synchronize a session between the application, like the, the single page application, and the OpenID Connect server. So that um, if the, the user session at the OpenID Connect server ends, you want to end it in the application. And another uh, protocol that you'll want to be aware of is one of our own, which we call the Assisted Token Flow, which is a uh, JavaScript-based API uh, that puts a lot of uh, lipstick around all of this and gives you a promise-based API that you can very easily integrate into your application. There are other vendors like Google who have also implemented similar uh, protocols, and we're working with the IETF to actually uh, include the assisted token uh, as an RFC. And I hope to have some news to share with you about that in the coming months. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. I mentioned um, discovery, discovery metadata. There's actually a couple different protocols. One is coming from the IETF and the other from the OpenID Foundation. The OpenID version came first. Uh, the OAuth protocol was written in a smart way so that any OpenID Connect implementation would conform to the OAuth version. There are some notable additions to the OAuth version that I want to point out. Uh, in the IETF version, you can actually define a software ID, as it's called, so that as you are doing uh, uh, discovery, you can find out uh, not only information about the, um, sorry, so that you can find information about your OpenID Connect server, and then you can um, take that client and dynamically register it in a way that you know the software on which it's based. So. Dynamic uh, discovery metadata is sort of like all of the settings related to your OpenID Connect server are published on the web, uh, and then you can download them and then dynamically bind your client into that. And by uh, using a uh, web finger, which is sort of like, uh, if you remember, finger from the Unix world, being able to find information about a user by looking at a login, uh, we can do the same sort of things by looking at an email address or a phone number. So if you enter a username or a phone number, I can go and find that that dynamic metadata of the or the dynamic metadata of the client of the server, pull that down, and then bind my client to it, and then know the the exact software and software version it's running, and then uh, I can manage that very dynamic infrastructure uh, in a very scalable way. And once I I use that email uh, address or phone number together with Webfinger to find that metadata, uh, I can use well-known URIs to even uh, locate additional information to start code flows and uh, the different flows within, within OAuth. So with dynamic client registration, every single application that you install becomes unique. So that if you download it from the App Store and you download it from the App Store and you download it from the App Store, all of us will have a different instance of that client. So that if Yours is compromised, 
and thankfully mine is not, or the other way around, that breach has a minimal effect. And this helps us to sleep better at night uh, and also to feel comfortable letting the user log in less frequently. It's because especially on a mobile device, we don't want to be asking the user to log in all the time. I build login for a living, and I love it, but users hate it. They don't ever want to see it. They don't ever want to log in, especially on a mobile device uh, where it can be kind of tricky and cumbersome. So by using dynamic client registration and by using um, the dynamic metadata, we can make it easier for every installation to become unique. We can issue them what's called a refresh token, which will allow a user to extend their session for quite some time and then reduce the amount of times that they have to log in to create a great user experience and to sleep well at night. I mentioned Skim before. This is really an API for all of your users. I um, have worked with LDAP many, many times, working with relational databases where users are stored, uh, other sorts of identity repositories, uh, and they all have their various pros and cons, but wouldn't it be just nice to call the REST service and just could I have back some JSON document that I can execute and know exactly you know, every field of that user, uh, where their first name will be, where their address will be, not have to go look it up in, in this version of LDAP or that version of LDAP. Skim really simplifies all of this by giving us a standard API and a standard schema for the user. And um, it is even extensible, so you can add in uh, other things depending on your deployment and your needs. Uh, so in the security server, for example, we extend the schema to allow for users to have their own devices to manage all of the delegations. So in that use case I mentioned with the consumer, uh, the, the customer service representative, you can call the scheme service, find all of the delegations uh, that have been issued uh, for that user, and then with a single delete command, you can delete all of their authorized applications. So scheme is a very extensible way of supporting those additional use cases. So now I've talked about the sort of bread and butter protocols, OAuth, OpenID Connect, HTTP, TLS, all of these, and how we need to use these with OpenID Connect uh, and Skim and these other more meaty protocols like revocation, introspection, uh, logout. And what's interesting now is to see like there's all of these different protocols, like I said, 2,000 printed pages. How are they being used in different sectors? Because this can be a helpful inspiration on how uh, you might want to use them, especially if you're in those same industries. So one I want to point out, I'm, I'm sort of becoming a fanboy uh, of, is uh, Heart, which is a healthcare profile for OpenID Connect. So this industry has gotten together and said, this is how we're going to do OAuth OpenID Connect in healthcare. And it's a US standard, but I think it's applicable even here in Europe. And they, what, what's interesting about Heart and why I'm becoming such a fanboy of it is because almost none of it is actually healthcare related or specific. And what they do is they sort of profile and turn a bunch of the recommendeds and maze of OAuth and OpenID Connect into musts and requires and mandatory to implement. So this takes the, the baseline uh, of security up a level and it makes the interoperability uh, increased. And so this is really going to help with the scalability uh, of the system and the platforms. So definitely look at Heart if you're in healthcare, and even if you're not, check it out. You can find it at the OpenID Foundation. Another is the financial uh, services or financial API, we're FAPI. This is also coming from the OpenID Foundation, and this is um, more specific to financial services and not as far along as Heart, but it is very interesting in that this is the only auxiliary standard of OAuth that defines an authentication protocol, almost. So it actually requires that a user log in with level of assurance 2, as defined by X1254, which is a UN standard, of how to log in. All of those other 50 specs say nothing about how the user is logged in. So you have to, have to solve all of that outside of the spec, which is going to be a major interoperability challenge. And FAPI is an interesting one where it's actually uh, using some of the existing standards uh, from the um, X524 uh, to actually do that in a high degree of assurance of who the user is. Another profile is iGov, coming from the OpenID Foundation. This is about using OpenID Connect and OAuth uh, in government sectors, but also, again, a good source of inspiration and for setting requirements and for seeing how people 
uh, have looked at these profiles and made sense of them to turn that soup into something more manageable and solid. So you do, do learn from, from, from them and how they've done it. Another very interesting and exciting space that is using these standards a lot is in the Internet of Things, where the Authentication and Authorization for Constrained Environments, or ACE, working group has been set up at the IETF to profile and specify how these standards should be used in smaller devices. And uh, they specify how these should work over uh, Constrained Application Protocol, or CoOp, which is the primary protocol used in many of these smaller um, environments. And co-op, for those of you who don't know, is sort of like HTTP at miniature scale. And there's even an RFC for mapping HTTP into co-op. Uh, and in that constrained environment, we can't use textual f tokens, like JWT tokens, so we, uh, and, and JSON in general. So we have cons constrained, concise binary object representation, which is a sort of binary version of JSON, and using uh, CBOR object signing encryption, we can uh, specify all the algorithms, the keys, the tokens, the signing, uh, all of that stuff in uh, in a standard way. And so then a uh, JWT token becomes a, a, a CBOR web token or a COT. Um, and this is interesting so that even in like an HTTP2 scenario where you have a binary stream, you can create a binary token and be uh, sending that around to have a smaller uh, packet size, even if you're not working in the Internet of Things. There is also a standard uh, called the device flow, and this device flow is for creating or getting a token in a device that might not have a fully featured browser. It's like a dashboard of a car, a set-top box, um, uh, your little Arduino. Uh, in those environments where you can't create a browser but, or to, to get the user logged in, but you still need an access token so you can call an API, what can happen is the user can start the flow in that constrained uh, device and then finish the login and do the login on a more featureful browser like on their mobile phone or in their laptop, and then it will finish up here on, the, on that small device uh, to get the, the access token it needs to access an API's data. So we already have standard flows that show that uh, we can go from the very, very small scale up to the cloud scale and even everything in between. So the, the security standards are already there uh, for, for scaling the platform. If you want to learn more about the device flow, my colleague Jakob Edeskog will be here tomorrow morning in this room explaining it in detail. The Achilles heel of OAuth is bearer tokens. Many of you have heard my analogy before. A bearer token is like cash. If you're lucky enough to find some cash outside on the street, you can go and spend it. If you find a credit card, unfortunately, that's mine. And the, the cashier or wherever you try to use that is going to check and see that it's mine and reject it. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to marry the access token that is issued to a user to the one who's presenting it in the same way as the credit card when it's presented is my own, and so you can't use it. And this is done using something called proof of possession, or POP, and there's an RFC for that explaining how to do that. And there's a lot of work right now to bind tokens using proof of possession to the TLS layer, and to the transport layer, security layer, so that uh, the tokens that are issued inside of a, a client are the same ones that are using it in the API. And Token binding is already supported by Chrome, it's supported by Windows Server, and it's using application layer protocol negotiation to figure out if the server and the client support this. So this actually allows token binding and proof of possession to be deployed at scale in a, in a sort of phased in way. And this is really gonna help to solve the Achilles heel or, or uh, alleviate the problem uh, of tokens being used by those to whom they weren't issued. And another example of that uh, where we're, the, the code that's used in the OAuth code flow is bound to the one who requested that code, and this is done by another standard called Pixie. And uh, this is a really important anti-phishing uh, protection that if you have a mobile app using OAuth, you should definitely be using this to ensure that your application is safe and secure. It's an easy add-on, and there's no reason not to. So for more advice like that, you can also find some best practices, the IETF, uh, has a best common practices for JSON web tokens that's in draft stage right now. 
but already contains some good advice, so you can check that out. Also, the threat model for OAuth, which is an RFC uh, that's been out for years, gives a lot of good advice on what not to do uh, and what to make sure you do to ensure that your implementation is secure. And uh, just last week, there was a new RFC created for specifying how you should use OAuth with native applications. A lot of good information there. Uh, and they even provided an open source implementation of iOS and Android. It's called AppAuth that sort of codifies all of those best practices. So now we've gone from soup to nuts, beginning to end. And I hope that from all of this, you have a bit better survey or overview of uh, these different standards and can see that you don't have to go and read all 2,000 pages, but at least some portions of them uh, that are the bread and butter. And then uh, when you start to dig into those main courses, those other protocols, you'll know what they do and can begin combining them as you need to. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate you coming and listening. Uh, to find out more about how we're using these standards in Curity, please visit us at our booth. Thanks.